Welcome to the Punk CX Podcast. My name is Adrian Swinsko. I'm an advisor, author, and general explorer of the service and experience space. My guests tend to have just released some interesting research. They run a company that has some interesting tech in the service and experience space. They are part of an organization that is doing some cool stuff, or they run their own business doing interesting things for both their customers and or their employees. That's enough for me. Let's get into the interview. Before we get into the podcast, I want to give a big shout out and thanks to the folks at Text Expander for sponsoring this episode of my podcast. Text Expander is an autocomplete tool that allows your team to eliminate repetitive typing and stay on the same page with just a few keystrokes, allowing you to delight more customers in less time. Check out the link in the show notes to find out more and to get a 20% discount for the first 12 months of Text Expander if you use the code SWINSCO. Now, let's get into the interview. So welcome back, actually. I mean, I, I, I do normally start these podcasts with saying welcome to them, but actually I'm going to say welcome back because I'm going to make the assumption that you've been here before and you're coming back to listen into some of the latest episodes of the Punk CX podcast. With me today, I have a returnee. So it is welcome back. Aha. And that is welcome back to Michael Ramsey, who is the VP of Customer Workflow Products at ServiceNow. Hi, Michael. How are you doing? Hi, Adrian. It's great to be back. Thanks for having uh, me. You're very welcome. Now, Michael, I know that I have a bit of, I'm getting older. I have Swiss cheese memory. I forget people's backstories and stuff. And so for my benefit, and maybe for the benefit of some people that kind of want a refreshment as well, is can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about, about yourself and the work that you do? Sure. Uh, so my name is Michael Ramsey, and I run the customer service management product team at ServiceNow. And for those of your listeners who may not know ServiceNow, uh, ServiceNow is a enterprise SaaS uh, company that really focuses on end-to-end uh, digital transformation. And for the most part, what that means is um, we do workflow orchestration, automation, you know, essentially managing work across the enterprise. Um, we started out in the technology or IT space. And then we've expanded into what we call employee workflows, you know, HR services, um, and then of course customer service, um, which is MySpace. Um, and then we also have a a platform or a creator workflow part of the portfolio. Awesome, thank you, Michael. Um, mm-hmm. The architecture of getting stuff done, exactly, guess, or, the, or the engineering of getting stuff done. Um, now. When I say welcome back, because you, I, I mean welcome back, because you were last on the podcast back in February 2021. And, and it's always nice to catch up with people when, when they come back on the podcast, because particularly when you introduce like an idea, which I think really resonated. I mean, last time we talked, you talked about this messy middle of customer experience. And I was like, it went clang. And it was like going, oh my God, what a great idea. And and it's something I've talked about, and it really resonates kind of with me. And and you explained what you meant by that, but mm-hmm. I wonder if you could tell us. I mean, what's happening with the messy middle? I mean, is it still a thing? I mean, are companies more aware of it now? I mean, have they made progress of it, or are we still dealing with a mess? Or is this a, is it a new mess? <laughs> no. So uh, I definitely think the messy middle is is still a thing. Um, it certainly is resonating. Uh, you know, my conversations with, with customers. Um, I, I do think that we're evolving a little bit in, in how we think about it. So maybe I'll, I'll reset things a little bit um, since, you know, 2021 was, <laughs> was, was a little bit ago. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the messy middle really um, amounts to at least for customer service in terms of outside of the customer service team or outside of the customer service experience from an end customer where you may have a self-service experience, you may have an agent-assisted experience, but there is work that needs to happen um, to fulfill a request by the customer in the rest of the company and the rest of the enterprise that um, that you know oftentimes is not this fully automated uh, end-to-end uh, fulfillment process. And it may go across different teams, different systems, and hence why it would be messy. Um, and I think that is still the case. Uh, another kind of way to think about the messy middle is 
what are the operations or the customer operations behind your products and services that you deliver to your customers um and and any work that needs to be performed on behalf of a customer so mm-hmm. i think that clearly is still the case you know those uh mm-hmm. that kind of work still exists you know in some cases certainly we've made progress you know as as a vendor certainly customers we work with have made process in term progress in terms of how they look at that work how they look at the workflow that needs to go across those teams and you know orchestrate it better report on it better manage it better um but clearly still a thing and i mean i think that's the kind of the i wonder if it's i mean i was just thinking about listening to you then i was just thinking about it and i was thinking about how we moved i mean in 21 february 21 we were still in the midst of the pandemic i mean fluctuating in and out of lockdowns and staying at home and and all these different things and things were largely remote mm-hmm. whereas now we've kind of changed into more of a and well when we're remote then our workplace is here like our screen in front of us yes. and with all the notifications and everything else kind of buzzing around it so it's almost like you're on when you're on even when you <clears throat> even when you're in, in a meeting sometimes you can always be on because there'll be still be things kind of like flashing up sort of thing where now we move better back into more of a sort of a, a many people have moved either back to the office or are in a hybrid or even sometimes have stayed remote so you end up with these different levels of availability i guess now and so i guess that's a, probably another mm-hmm. level of complexity if you need to sort of escalate to somebody or to reach out to somebody to get that insight or access to or whatever it might be and so mm-hmm. there's that it's going to be this ever evolving thing it's not just about systems it's also about behaviors and patterns of work and stuff as well right yes yes no completely and certainly at at service now my my job is that way it is a hybrid working environment um i mean to some degree i would argue even before the pandemic it was that way because you know we have teams all over the world we we often meet with them so even if i was going into an office somebody who i'm meeting with might not be um and so that is definitely still the case. Um, uh, another way that we're talking about this that might resonate with you is some of this work and some of the work we're talking about in the messy middle or or in the customer operations or however you want to talk about it is essentially glued together by humans. Um, mm-hmm. and, and we've been talking about this as human middleware um, right. to get this work done. Um, now, I think that some of the pandemic and the the whole focus on working from home, and this even applies to customer service teams, is we had to enable people to work from home. So if if we didn't have a good setup to do that, you know, like um, you know, we're on a video conferencing uh, tool doing this this conversation, um, we had to figure that out, and and so I, I think we are in a better place in terms of we can talk to people, we can get people together, um, you know, digitally quickly. It's not that big of a deal. Um, like I've I've even had good experience is as we start doing more customer discovery, we're doing shadowing of call centers and of, of, of agents and whatnot. Um, those experiences, you know, historically were not great, you know, doing, doing it over video or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, but now because everybody was remote, those are actually quite good now. Um, Mm -hmm. and there are actually advantages to doing that. So, you know, I still prefer to be in person and I think it's still more valuable to be in person for a lot of those, those kinds of events. But I would say we, we actually have better tooling in place so that we can actually work across these teams. Yeah. I mean, so that's kind of how the the pandemic kind of changes, but then we kind of came out of the pandemic and there was like every sort of... (laughs) Mm-hmm. exhaled kind of quite a bit and then <laughs> took a sharp intake of breath kind of when then the next crisis kind of came along let's not talk about that but it's created all sorts of macroeconomic kind of like um challenges in particular mm-hmm. i mean particularly over the last kind of like 12 to 18 months i mean has that changed things on the both the kind of the demand side but also just generally how customers and well your the, the companies that you work with how they're dealing with it or how they're approaching it yeah, I think things have changed. Um, and I, I want to say back in our 21 conversation, we might have even talked about the macroeconomic conditions and how 
um, customer service specifically has has kind of gone over these um, these different perspectives. Where you know, when I, I've been in the space for twenty five years, and when I first got in the space in the late nineties. Um, customer service and you know maybe more broadly customer experience was was more of a a cost center. It, it was you know whatever you can do to cut costs, you know to deflect calls, to you know irregardless of what the customer outcome is. It mm-hmm. was it was I need to optimize my own expenses, and then I think that shifted you know with you know the original internet bubble. And kind of the the growth in customer service technology and whatnot that became much more um, of a shift from cost center to how can I become a revenue center or how can I help you know drive business business strategy and and growth. And then I think the pandemic hit, macroeconomic conditions, everything hit, and it was oh whoa we 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 need to uh, you know relook at things and we we only want to fund things that are absolutely necessary a necessity and 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 it really became cost conscious again and i felt like i was you know going back in time 20 years or something hmm. um but i think what has happened over the last uh, couple of years since we spoke uh, my conversations with customers is yes they're still conscious like they don't they don't want to make an investment lightly um and they're not just going to throw money around but there is optimism and and there is the the kind of conscious view that okay, yes, I need to efficiently use my resources, but we need to grow. And, 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 you know, I need to care about customer experience because that's part of how I grow and I need to care about customer outcomes. And so I do think that um, that's one big difference in the conversation with customers I'm having. And, and like, we, we are fully embracing that. We're like, yes, <laughs> you, you do need to efficiently use your resources. You need to get more out of your resources but you need to grow like you need to do both yeah and so i mean we've talked to, we've talked to about it and we talked around it and we've talked about the conditions impacting it um but so what are companies doing about cleaning up the the, the messy meals and also kind of more importantly kind of how is things like what you guys are doing in terms of technology and ai and process mining and all that sort of good stuff kind of what sort of role is that kind of playing in it sort of to help with all of that sort of stuff? Because otherwise you could look at it just on a sure. piece of paper and you go like crumbs, that's a big job. Yep. So how are you making the big jobs easier, Michael? That's yeah. the big question. <laughs> so um, I think it's, let me talk a little bit about what we're doing from a product perspective to try to make this easier uh, for customers. And I think it's, it's broadly applicable first we're trying to make sure that not only do we make this possible to, um, you know, make sure that you you can capture your customers' requests, and you can do that, you know, in a frictionless, uh, efficient way to make it easy on them, um, and then, you know, you automate and you orchestrate the workflow to fulfill that request. So we're definitely very focused on that. Um, I think we're taking that a step further and making sure that, you know, we can we can productize what those requests are based on the products and services that your customer is entitled to, you know, based on, for example, what they've bought, what they've purchased, what they've subscribed to, so that, you know, you can easily surface relevant requests to that customer. And, and if that customer, you know, is willing to, wants to, you know, handle that in a self-service manner, you, you, you should do that. You should make that possible. You should surface that on whatever channels they prefer, whatever channels you support. Um, I and mean, I think we're making we're making strides on that front. And then in terms of the fulfillment workflow behind that, um, you know, we're doing a lot to make sure that whether or not this is human middleware, like we're we're providing right. the tool to to make sure that well, if somebody's sick, it that's okay, it will still work. It's it's not a specific person that has to know everything. You can digitize those processes, and and I would say we're looking at this in kind of two buckets. One is what are these non-revenue transactions? Like I'm changing my address. I, you know, I want to increase my credit limit. I want to enable international roaming. What, whatever it is, it may not be. You know, you have to pay me more for that service. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, but there are. I want to buy something. I want to return something. I want to renew something. And so those are kind of order of financial based transactions. So I think we're we're, we're productizing things in those buckets. Um, but 
I thought maybe it'd be worthwhile to talk about like a customer example that's a little bit different than the ones I talked about the last time we spoke, mm-hmm. which um, was in financial services and in retail, which is one of our telco customers, um, Rogers um, up in, in Canada. And one of the things uh, if in, in the telco space, if you think about customer operations, um, it's, you know, all of the teams involved in delivering essentially digital services or telco services to their customers. And, and it's very common in the telco space that those companies have grown through acquisition. So th- they might have even a more complicated messy middle than, yeah. than other organizations. And in the case of Rogers, um, you know, they're offering all of these different services on top of networks and they had you know, different teams managing these different services kind of from soup to nuts. And so, so a customer may have multiple services. In fact, most of them would have multiple services, but internally to Rogers, those were different teams. Those were different customer operations teams. Those were different SE middles across all those services. And then, you know, that, that gets exposed to the, to the end customer. Um, And so the, what they did was they centralized those. They they had common processes by with common teams, even though historically these were separate teams, and you know, and they had and they had the full kind of infrastructure to do that. And you know, they had some really interesting um, outcomes just in terms of how they've enabled customer self service. You know, they had I think forty one percent decrease in the number of customer cases that had to be worked on, you know, by a human within their teams, uh, which was pretty massive in terms of the customer experience side of those things. Um, But I I thought that might be kind of a a good example where it, it's not necessarily, you know, it's very tangible, like it's directly related to the products they deliver to their customers, Mm -hmm. but it still was messy. Um, And, and then what they did to kind of combine those, and so how would you have gone about sort of like when you talk about centralizing the things, but you, you centralize things and then you, but you, I guess it feels to me like, yes, you might have dip, disparate teams that have come about under the, come under the same umbrella through a, a process of, or a journey of acquisition, let's say, and you've got different teams that are managing this and you, you want to centralize it. You want to normalize kind of how you approach it. And is that the, there's, and to in order, in order to, to do that, to understand all of the, like how they're how they're doing it. I mean, is that where that things like um, and and then also looking for other opportunities around where you can create more efficiencies? Is that where is that where the the, the role of process mining really comes into its own? So it, it certainly can. And in in process mining and what we call process optimization is once you have a, you have kind of put the scaffolding in place for digitizing a process, um, even if humans are having to perform a lot of tasks or actions within that process. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we can start mining the data uh, from that process. So, you know, from when in our case, for the most part, it's going to be a case or an order, you know, gets assigned from one person or one team to another, um, you know, when tasks get performed or completed um, and, and others get kicked off, we we have we have all of that data uh, within our system, and we can we can start surfacing um, insights based on that. You know, for example, you know, is is that work item getting bounced back and forth, or internally we call this ping ponging, you know, back and mm-hmm. forth. Um, uh, and it could be between the customer and your teams, or it could be between teams that the customer doesn't see; they just know it's they're not getting what they what they ask for, right? Um, and so to me, process mining or, or what we call process optimization is part of once you have these processes digitized and, and, you know, you've, um, you know, delivered them to production, they're live, you know, how do you help optimize them? And, and you can do that with like, in the case of, uh, of a Rogers or like a, a telecommunications company you may have explicit SLAs that you're managing to, or you have internal o- OLAs that help you meet those SLAs. And, you know, we can say, well, optimize for limiting violations um, and, right. and then surface, well, what are, what are the causes for an SLA violation? And, and, and sometimes it can be really simple kind of, you know, no brainer stuff, 
but it still isn't obvious because there's so much work happening. Um, and, right. and it may not be obvious that, well, you know, we're tossing work back and forth between these two teams and nobody, you know, it's, 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 there's no purpose in doing that. It's just, it's people are having to, you know, take their time to come back up to speed and figure out what they need to do. And, you know, and then they toss it to another team. So, right. In the last sort of six months or so, then it feels like the world's changed again because generative AI in the in the form of chat GPT via kind of like open AI has appeared on the scene. And mm -hmm. sometimes it feels like where I read all the different developments and all the the new apps and the new kind of capabilities that it's going to um and it's it and it, that that's that it's developing and like I'm pretty sure that kind of you know, chat GPT is going to win the next hundred meters at the next Olympics kind of by the kind of the, the, the rate of development right now. And so mm -hmm. perhaps we should just go all go home and just leave kind of like generative AI to it. Um, <laughs> he says tongue firmly in cheek. Um, but right now, I mean, we, everybody is talking about generative AI and what we cannot escape is that one it's entered into mainstream kind of consciousness and people are talking about it and that's a big deal mm -hmm. and people are actually it's 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 lit in a fire in people's imagination about the possibilities and stuff um but i'm sort of also just kind of talking to people about going well so how is it changing and accelerating or challenging the way that you're going to do things and also the way that 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 mm -hmm. i mean can we just kind of point generative ai at kind of the messy middle and just go sort out the messy middle go on and then just leave it to it or is it more to it than that <laughs> yeah so uh i definitely hear you uh i think there's more to it than that i <laughs> oh, thank goodness um I think this is a, a super exciting area. And I think about this kind of on, on different vectors. Um, one of them is it is really compelling new technology. And I think it is going to have kind of an immediate impact on some areas. And I think we're already starting to see that if you think about consumer behavior, consumer search as, you know, as an area, um, you know, chat GPT hit, 100 million users faster than any app ever. Um, well, a lot of that is for stuff like consumer search. Um, and so I do think, especially for customer service, it, it will have those kinds of almost immediate impacts. And, and we've already started to see that. Um, but for me, and for example, for ServiceNow, I think it's it helps us solve a problem that was very difficult for us to solve with you know previous AI. And one of our, our challenges was even for something like a bot or what we call a virtual agent, um, it took a lot of training, you know, a lot of training data, a lot of, you know, often highly skilled, rare skill sets, people, professional services to actually, you know, deploy a virtual agent or a bot with natural language understanding and, um, and, and for the most part, it had to be a pretty narrow domain to do a really good job. Mm -hmm. um, well, this you know makes it very exciting that we we can overcome that very quickly. We we can um, we can deploy self service experiences that you know used to take months and weeks now, um, mm -hmm. in some cases maybe even days. So I think broadly that's super compelling. I think the um, just the advances in the interface itself for questions and answers and you know how you interact with a bot it's it's so much better it's order of magnitudes better in terms of how i can ask questions and get answers um and then we're already applying it to you know a lot of capabilities that we had already built out with you know frankly what are now older machine learning and, and ai which are things like summarizing a chat conversation with a customer, um, mm -hmm. summarizing a long running case, like for the messy middle. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just like, we've done a bunch of proof of concepts, working with customers on this. And it's, it's super compelling to be able to have, have a concise, you know, easy to understand uh, in whatever language you want. This is what this three week old case has happened. This is what the customer wanted. This is what we've done about it. And, and I can immediately know something that I would have had to be reading through reams of data in the past. Um, also things like 
us providing recommendations or assistance to agents for assist assisted service for replies to customers. Like a lot of things that were really hard to do before seem possible now. And, right. and I think you, you will see that. Um, but I, I think your your point about, well, you know, you have something like chat GPT or generative AI more generally, you know, we could, we, it's a magic button. Um, and, and I, and I don't think that is the case. So like one of the ways that we look at the value that we provide is with Gen AI, I can get my answer much faster and more easily and maybe to a much broader set of, of customers, but okay. I have that answer. What do I do about it? You know, like, yeah. uh, like this is how I return something. This is how I, you know, get this feature enabled. This is how I do. Well, you still need to take the action that the answer is telling you. Um, and so I, I still think that like, that's where the messy middle problem comes in, which is you still need to do work to give the customer what they want. Like chat GPT is not going to, you know, at least today, it, you know, it didn't make my coffee this morning. Yeah. No, I think, I think there was a, um, I, I keep repeating it, but uh, there's a really interesting distinction that somebody shared with me previously on the podcast about around this. And they said, the interesting mm -hmm. way to think about it is uh, tool time and task time. And mm -hmm. if the, the technology helps reduce the tool time and then frees up more time to do the task, as it were, or it just it allows mm -hmm. you to spend the same amount of time on the task, but just free, frees up the, um, the tool time. Like, for example, an agent summarizing something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The summarization is not yeah. necessarily how long it takes you to think about something. It's the time it takes you to type it all. Yeah. Yep. And so if somebody's doing the kind of the task of the summarization and you read it through and go, yeah, that's right. Don't, here we go. Done. Yeah. No, I think, I think that's spot on. I also think, you know, selfishly uh, for me, cause I'm, I'm in software. If you look at how Gen AI, you know, and co-pilot features for developers for mm -hmm. writing code, yeah, like it is, it's a massive multiplier. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, like, I do think in terms of, IT for software implementations, for software development, in anything that is based on language, it's it's super powerful. Yeah. And so do you can have a um, I mean, it's coming back to the messy middle because that's the kind of the big kind of problem at hand. I mean, that's the thing that that really affects sort mm -hmm. of customer and employee outcomes. That's the nut that we've got to crack. I mean, generative AI and chat GPT and and yeah. Bard and Ernie and Bakuna and Llama and kind of whatever other kind of like LLM you yeah. want to kind of like roll out onto the um, yep. the usual suspect parade. Um, they are kind of tools in that sort of like space. The messy middle is is, is, a, yes. is like this, an organic kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Who's been tackling it kind of really well that, that, that you can, they can share with us as an example of around kind of, what it was, what they've done, and how they've kind of benefited, just to sort of like to bring that whole thing to life. Because I think we we you know sure. we often don't acknowledge some of this sort of stuff. And service is often talked about as response times and kind of self serve and all these different things. But actually, the really harder sort of stuff is where, well, actually, where the real kind of emotion and make or break sort of stuff can actually kind of happen. I think, and so and the messy middle sort of like feeds directly mm -hmm. into that. So mm -hmm. a couple of success stories would be nice just to, to light the way, Michael. Sure, sure. And I think one, maybe I can tie together actually some of the, the messy middle concepts and even the like Gen AI, Gen AI topic mm -hmm. we just talked about. So last, last week um, uh, we had our annual user conference that we call Knowledge in Las Vegas, um, which by the way was, was, my first time to do that in person and, and the first time where it's really felt like post pandemic we're we're back at it we're, we're back to normal uh, at, yeah. least, at least in my space um but one of the great things about it was you know i could meet so many customers in person um you know all, all within just a few days and one of the customers that we've been spending a lot of time with and working with is um starbucks the coffee company um yeah and i think this this is where we're working on how do we apply things like Gen AI to the both the customer, the agent, the kind of middle office personas um, that that kind of permeate the messy middle. And some of the examples um, 
or use cases where I think it kind of brings it to life are, um, you know, this is a, you know, retail operation. There are, you know, thousands of stores across the world. Um, you have customers who are having, you know, in-person experiences, um, but they they may need to perform, uh, you know, they may have requests that require work that, that goes, a, goes across the company that is not just the customer service team. And some of those, um, like we did a couple of demos on stage that were, you know, hypothetical, but they're real use cases for, for Starbucks. And some of those are, um, uh, for example, in, in one of our keynotes, um, the demo persona had ordered coffee at, you know, that they were going to go to pick up, but they ordered it to the wrong store because they're going across Vegas from one, one resort right. to another. And so they're like, okay, I'm not going to go back to the other, you know, casino to pick up my coffee order. Um, I'll just get one here, but then, you know, I need to refund that order because I'm not going to go pick it up. And so something like that, you would, you'd think, okay, well, why is that a messy middle or, or what's the big problem there? Well, um, you know, first there may be two options. Do you want to transfer the order to your, you know, your current store where you are going to be to pick it up so you don't have to order it again? Or let's say you, you've already ordered it at the new store and you want a refund. Well, that's going to, re, you know, we're going to put, you know, credit ba credit balance back on your credit card. We're, we're going to have to go through some formal approval process where it, like they don't just automate all of that stuff. Uh, so on purpose, um, right. because it's a financial transaction. And so that was an example where, um, you know, from the customer's standpoint, they can just say what their issue is and what they need very easily. And, and we leveraged a, a, a Gen AI uh, solution. In this case, it was OpenAI. Um, but then there's the work that that kicked off, which was, okay, refund this order or transfer this order from one store to the other. And so then that, you know, kicks off work that, um, Somebody either has to approve, yes, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and uh, you know restore the balance to their credit card, or you know I'm just going to you know cancel the order at one location and, and add it to another. So that uh, let me just kind of pause there. But uh, to me, that that is kind of a real example where you can see, okay, the customer gets their their request taken care of, and you know they get their caffeine fix, and uh, they, they can go about their day. And then whatever needs to happen um, on the Starbucks side, um, that work also happens. And but surely that you could also kind of like you could also going to lean into that and then apply some sort of business rules around that, around saying, no, if this is just X or it's within Y sort of range, as it were, then do an auto approval. But you know, make sure right. that you ring fence a particular store and all these different things to make sure that you kind of like you minimize or you monitor <laughs> leakage at kind of like particular, you know, location by location, all that type of stuff. Yep. Yeah, no, very much so. And, you know, for for a company like Starbucks, there there's certainly kind of uh, because, because this is real revenue, you can certainly do it based on order size. And you certainly have people who will you know, it's essentially catering, you know, you're, you're going to bring coffee and pastries for an all hands meeting or, <laughs> yeah, or, or a conference, things like that, that could be very big dollar. And you, you certainly can, can automate rules with regard to dollar amount. There's also different aspects of fraud. They have to be, you know, conscious of, uh, that, uh, that can also be part of the rules and the automation. Um, and then there are also, uh, rewards programs and, this is this is another interesting aspect of, of Gen AI where um, I've seen some someone post a demo video of how they basically spoofed a conversation with a customer service rep trying to get a discount on their bill where they just kind of had Gen AI be them um, and just negotiate for a discount on their bill. Right. Well, you can you can think well. That doesn't just mean that okay, customer service and all these companies are gonna you know lose their shirt. Well, you can just put in place um, uh, rules and automation of your own to say, well, don't give away the store on rewards points. Don't uh, you know yeah. how much you know a customer service rep can uh, can give in terms of a discount on a bill because of a bad experience or uh, or whatever. Mm -hmm. No, and I think that's it's also kind of like it deals with that sort of the. Um... 
And I guess you've got to strike the balance because it makes me think about in <clears throat> in that sort of situation, there's there's a trust and discretion kind of bit when you're dealing with a human to human sort of interaction. Um, mm-hmm. and that's that's kind of fair mm-hmm. enough. And that should be I sh- I would imagine that that should be a part of every good company's operating sort of system. But then when you kind of start to kind of you're starting to automate things as much as possible to allow customers to you know, self-serve and get quick service and make it convenient and easy and things as well, then you want to minimize the human middleware, but also the kind of manage the kind of the and I kind of the input required, but also kind of um manage the the risk as well. So it's a, it's quite a complex thing. But it's you know but it's it's good that, that, that it's kind of smoothing that sort of stuff out. Yeah, no, very much so. And and I, I completely agree with you in terms of the human element and empowering your employees to, uh, you know, to, to use their own discretion. Um, but I, I would say part of that answer is to make sure they have all the information they need so that they can actually use their discretion properly. And like, for example, in the, uh, the refund order example, you know, it can be as simple as, oh, they ordered the same thing literally within 30 minutes and it was two different stores, but their story checks out, you know, yeah. um, or you can also um, look at, well, how many times do they get, you know, ask for refunds on their order? Um, and, you know, so there's a lot of, I think the ability to leverage um, the customer, the customer's interactions with the company, their past history, um, not to mention, you know, surfacing up, you know, maybe an employee who wants to do something for a customer needs reassurance on the policies that, yeah. you know, that, that govern those actions. Um, yeah. So I, I think th- there's a lot to it. Like you said, it's, it's complicated, but I, I also think they're solvable problems. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is that just because it's complicated doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't kind of like lean into it and address it because I think I, I would challenge everybody, particularly if they work for a large organization that it exists I this messy middle thing, the thing that we don't generally mm-hmm. talk about, it exists mm-hmm. a, a lot. And you just have to think about kind of like the stuff that feels like it, it's hard to do or it takes up a lot of time. And that's probably it kind of like mm-hmm. sticking out from behind that cupboard somewhere in that sort of office somewhere else and deep in the, in the heart of the kind of the, um, the, the organization. But also at the same time is that it, it's to, to realize that even if you're kind of going and interacting with your own sort of firm or you interact with kind of firms, then these things do kind of happen. They're very real. When things get difficult, it's it's more often than not, it's probably going to be that in that domain of the messy middle. They just haven't got things well connected or well orchestrated to kind of help solve those kind of problems. And and the reality mm-hmm. of, of it is, is that as technology is helping um, and digital services are helping um, automate and make self-service more and more accessible to more and more people that actually more and more and, and the likelihood is that when you contact a, uh, uh, somebody a brand about something it's more likely to be more complex kind of problem it's going to re more likely going to touch those kind of messy middles as it were then it becomes a very present and very real kind of problem mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. no c- completely agree um and I do think, you know, to your point, it's complex. It doesn't mean you shouldn't tackle it. I do think that, you know, the the technology and the the tooling, it obviously doesn't solve the problem. There are people, there are organizations. Um, but you know, even putting in kind of the the basic scaffolding to say, you know, manage, you know, work on behalf of the customer that does fall into the messy middle. You know, even if you're, you know, you're still leveraging email, you're still, you're still dealing with people on different teams. There, there's huge value in just gaining uh, visibility in terms of at least when, well, when does it get handed off to one team to another? Uh, when, when does, when do they do what they need to do? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, and and I think you can incrementally tackle some of those problems mm-hmm. um, and make one just having visibility is a huge benefit. Um, but then you can actually start taking decisions, you can actually start uh, automating. Uh, where do you think, I mean, it's, it, where do you think that's the, the, some of the biggest indicators would be? I mean, if you have, I guess, internal OLAs or SLAs, whatever you want to call them, mm-hmm. are those the things to look at and where you're in breach of those internal sort of SLAs or OLAs? Is those, the, when you're in breach of them, are those 
likely indicators is that's where the biggest problems a lie or is that could that be misleading um so i wouldn't necessarily say that that necessarily means those are the biggest problems uh, i think those are relatively um they're definitely indicators and there's something you can you can take action on and, and it depends like some businesses you know purposefully you know don't maintain 99 or 100 percent sla adherence on purpose because it actually doesn't make business sense. Um, right. But at least they know um, and, and they have visibility and they can take action when they want to. Um, I actually think, you know, maybe this this goes back to some of like the work that you've done under the uh, punk brand um, is is really thinking about some of the bigger outcomes and, um, you know, customer outcomes and customer experience. Obviously, on a certain level, an SLA can be an indicator of, you know, if I'm expecting something, you know, in an hour and I get it in a day, um, I'm going to have a bad experience. And so you should tackle that. But I think oftentimes at a lot of these companies that, you know, are large and, you know, have been built up through acquisition or, or organically, you may not have an SLA that's directly mapping the work that's happening. So I, I think that's where some of the bigger issues may not necessarily surface from SLA violations. Okay. And so, I mean, what would be your best advice then if if we could have, if we could have said, let's all agree that the mass of middle exists, that it's there. Mm -hmm. If we need to go and find some of these messy middles, where should we start? I mean, I think that you should definitely take care of the little hanging fruit. But to me, um, in, in conversations I have with customers, it, it's really having a kind of customer centric view on your business and what is the customer experience. I, I think, um, you know, whether it's, it's like a kind of a retail operation, like we mentioned in terms of Starbucks, whether it's a digital business, like a, a Rogers, we talked about, you know, how, how do your customers interact with you? What are their top requests, you know, in, in it, you know, it could be order based or financial transaction based. It, it could, it could be non-financial transaction based. But, you know, what are those representative set of experiences and outcomes that customers have and then, you know, kind of work backwards into because I, I do right. think that, the, you know, that battle between kind of company centric, uh, customer centric, it always is going to make more sense to me if you're starting from the customer centric view. Perfect. No, that's fine. So, Michael, um we're racing on with kind of time, but is there anything else you'd like to add or highlight kind of um, before we, uh, that, or that, we, that we've missed out before kind of, I asked you a couple of kind of wrap up questions to kind of, to bring our talking about the messiness kind of like sure. to an end. I, I mean, we, we've covered a fair amount of ground. Um, like I do want to make sure I cut it, you know, come across. Uh, I'm super optimistic on, on this problem. And, and I think how we're solving this problem and and I, I think that's generally true of the you know the customers I work with. You know, we 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 went through the pandemic. You mentioned, you know, we have a lot of difficult things from a macro standpoint across the world. But to me, there there's this optimism to tackle these, even though they're hard and complex problems. And, and I think that's something I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to imply that uh that this is glass uh, half empty. It is definitely glass half full. And, you know, to me, technology like Gen AI is only, you know, another tool, in, in fact, a better tool to help us solve yeah. those problems. No, absolutely. I mean, I would echo the, what you said about the kind of the, um, well, optimism. I'm generally optimistic, although with a bit of skepticism and realism kind of thrown in, obviously. Um, but I would say that the idea of taking a customer centric, um, uh, view and going starting with the customer and thinking about the problems and also the jobs that they want to do or the things mm -hmm. that they want to achieve and then work mm -hmm. backwards from there and think about what's mm -hmm. easy what's mm -hmm. not so easy what could be harder what could be better you're not going to go kind of that yeah. wrong you're not going to i mean that's going to be very much value or yeah. and and i think uh didn't mean to cut you off but i, th I think like simple examples are if if you know what your customers want to do or what they're entitled to do based on the products and services you deliver to them, you know, then don't just give them a blank form. Even, even if you have a really good chat bot, don't just give them a, you know, a yeah. blank asking question. No, like 
surface a you know an, an easy way for them to tell you what they want um and and and, and you know it, it may sound super simple but oftentimes we don't do that so. yeah i mean it's, it's like yeah the worst thing you do is give somebody a blank sheet of paper you go yeah and they look at you, you go what but <laughs> Sometimes prompts and in, uh, understanding intents or giving getting people started is or starting kind of from their perspective is, is always very much much help more helpful. Anyway, I'm gonna yep. stop yabbering yep. on. Yep. But what I was going to say was, um, so we did cut to the chase, Michael, and I said to you, right, based on everything we've learned over the last kind of two three years, massive changes and challenges and all these different things, we have to boil it down to Michael says, here's my best advice. To someone that wants to improve their customer employee experience, Michael says, "Do this." Dot dot dot. Complete the sentence. Mm -hmm. In the in you know in that sort of style of, I'm I'm starting you off sort of thing, like we were talking about in the previous kind of question. What would mm -hmm. you say, Michael mm -hmm. says, "Do this." What would that be? Sure. So I think the number one thing is is kind of what we were just talking about, which is do the discovery on on how your customers interact with you and follow it end to end, you know, understand all of your partners, your employees, you know, the different personas that are going to either interact directly with that customer or they're going to, they're going to do work on behalf of that customer and understand what tasks they need to perform, what context they need to perform those tasks, what, you know, what, uh, what they need to know to be successful um, you know, and, and there, there's no, to me, there's, there's no shortcut. Like no. you, you need to do that discovery. And frankly, you should probably have, you know, a cadence for doing that because things change and you hire more people and, and yeah. you roll out new products, um, and you acquire new customers and you get new customers and customers change yeah. and, and, yeah. and their needs change and all these different things. And so, yeah, yeah staying on it, it's not a one and done thing. It's yeah. like, you've got to keep doing it. As you say, you got to have a, a regular revisit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think like uh, we talk quite a bit about employee experience and customer experience. And like one of the things that, you know, why I'm so excited that the world is open back up and we can do discovery and we can go shadow uh, our customers is, you know, employees, want to succeed they want to do the right thing you know they they as humans like we naturally have empathy when we're interacting with another another person and but you can also see how they struggle when they don't have enough information about the customer or they don't they're unsure of what they can do or what they should do or like you you immediately see this you know this lack of confidence or you know and, and then you know, that does really make a difference in terms of the experience the customer gets, um, you know, and, and that can be from onboarding a new employee to training them, to supporting them, you know, with the right tool set so they can do their job. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So one last question, because I need to go. Um, and I'm sure you do too. Um, yes. But it's related to the Punk XL book that I wrote. And it says that idea around experience leadership, because it's, I think we all starting to recognize that experience is this multi-dimensional interconnected thing. It's not just about customer experience. Mm -hmm. It's about customer experience, employee experience, stakeholder, societal, investor, leadership, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to ask, and I've been asking lots of different people about this, is like, um, mm -hmm. who's setting the bar? Who's being an experienced kind of leader? Who's got all these things connected together that's kind of, and, 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 and it's sort of showing the way. Yeah. So I think we, we've talked about several different customers and in, including Rogers and Star, Starbucks in terms of what they're doing. And, and I, I am impressed and I would put them in this category. Um, but let me throw out another customer. Um, uh, which is more of an old school technology company, uh, Xerox, who we've worked closely with over the last couple of years. Um, and, and I would say th they're another um, example of taking a look at this holistically, understanding their customers, understanding a pretty complicated set of internal organization, external organizations, employees, partners who participate in that customer experience and uh you know frankly in some cases kind of 
uh, reinventing things, um, you know, and leveraging technology where it makes sense. And like, I would say in that example, different than gen AI, but something like um, augmented reality and trying to solve a problem where you have customers who, you know, may have your, your classic copy or different products that, that Xerox um, may uh, sell and service. And, you know, they're either having an issue with how it works or doesn't work. And can you surface um, the right information, the right content so they can help themselves? Um, mm -hmm. Or no, like some things actually do need to be maintained. They do need to be replaced, you know, and then you have, you know, a very complex set of, you know, uh, badged employees, uh, third-party contractors, um, and a an aging workforce that, you know, frankly, a lot of institutional knowledge um, is leaving the workforce. And so yeah. then you're bringing new people. How do you do that? And how do you give them the, the proper skill sets? Still maintaining the kind of in-customer experience, but knowing that you have a really complex group of people and teams that have to do stuff to, to deliver that good customer experience. Yeah. So I would say they're, a, they're another one in addition to like Starbucks uh, that I said, we've been spending a lot of time with who've, you know, we've gone through this pandemic. I think they have a um, really interesting business where with the pandemic, that whole traditional in-store experience, I mean, you're getting coffee, you're getting a pastry or something. <laughs> you, you have to, you have to get that physical good. Um, but during the pandemic, you know, over half their revenue shifted to their mobile app because people were ordering it on their mobile app. They were picking it up at the store, having it delivered. And that behavior actually hasn't changed. So that's a, uh, that's a, you know, retail customer business, you know, traditional kind of brick and mortar, but it's now a digital business. Um, yeah. and, and, and they're still kind of really focused. I don't think any of them would say, look, we're on the summit of the punk, uh, experienced leadership mountain. Um, but I think they're all, you know, working their way up the switchbacks to uh, to get to the summit. Awesome. Awesome. Well, it's good to kind of, I, I think that, I think we have to build something. Might be something like a close encounters thing, what I call the, the punk XL sort of mountain. <laughs> all right. But I think um, that's great. Uh, Michael, thank you for that. And thank you for kind of helping me kind of like revisit the whole messy experience and messy middle of customer experience and customer service and and giving your view on kind of like where it's at and how people are addressing it and what you guys are doing to help with that and giving us some insights and sharing some stories with us um with us today that has been awesome and um thank you welcome back to the podcast you're always a welcome guest do come again and uh that's all i have for today so thank you thank you my pleasure Wow, what a great interview. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Find out more about me and the work that I do at adrianswinsco.com. Do leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. And if you have any comments, feedback, or questions about the podcast, then feel free to send me a message to podcast at adrianswinsco.com. And do tune in again. Thanks very much.